Hi, I'm Ashley with Campbell. Thanks for investing your time to help your community be a great place to live. Before you watch the video, make sure to click the subscribe button so that we can help you make educated decisions as a board member. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Evan Bradley. I'm one of the partners here at Campbell Property Management. I'm also a licensed community association manager, and I work very closely with many of our larger communities on the main issues that are impacting them. And every year around this time, hurricane prep is always one of those issues. So um, for those of you who may not be as familiar with Campbell or are new to our webinar series, we've been in business, as Akari mentioned, since 1953. We manage over 400 condominium and HOA clients here, all exclusively in South Florida. We are primarily in Dade, Broward, Palm Beach, and Martin counties, uh, as well as a little bit into St. Lucie County now. So we pride ourselves on retention of existing customers. We uh, have approximately 98% annual renewal rate, um, and that's with 30-day cancellation clauses in all of our contracts. We're also the highest rated company on Google, so please do go see what others have had to say about working with Campbell Management online. So joining us today, we have two experts in the field of uh, hurricane preparedness and, and even more importantly, claims management. We have Paul Mack and Chad Tiernan of Assured Partners. So Paul and Chad, do you guys want to introduce yourselves and your firm a little bit? Thank you, Evan. Uh, appreciate being here with you today. Yes, uh, Chad and I specialize in community association insurance and claims management. Um, I've been an, an independent insurance agent for uh, 30 years, and uh, we here at Assured Partners have over 3,000 uh, condominium, HOA, uh, co-op, community association clients that that we uh, that we service for insurance needs. Thanks, guys. Yep. So very excited to have us here. Uh, thank you. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Obviously, very important topic. Mm -hmm. All right, so why don't we get into it a little bit. When is hurricane season? Most everybody knows June 1 and November 30th. Um, we've had a pretty fortunate run here, knock on wood, over the last few years. Uh, there have been a lot of hurricanes, uh, but South Florida itself has not been uh, directly impacted in quite a while. Uh, 2023, we had 20 named storms, seven hurricanes with three of them major. Um, that's way above average. Uh, the average is about 12 named storms a year. And we do have a 2024, hur 2024 hurricane forecast out already, uh, which is predicting an extremely active season with 23 named storms, 11 hurricanes, five major hurricanes. Um, this is a really important graph. Uh, hurricane, not all the months in hurricane season are created equal. In fact, there's a huge spike in hurricane activity and especially for the type of hurricanes that we need to be aware of here in South Florida. And that really occurs between August 20th and October 20th. You can see this massive run up in the number of hurricanes and tropical storms uh, in that time period. So that's really the peak of the season for us, but now is a good time to start thinking about um, what do we need to be doing and how do we need to be preparing? Waiting till August will not, uh, will not help you. So we have had some near misses over the last uh, eight years or so, start going back to Matthew in 2016. And as you can see, these all occurred during those peak months of the season, and they were all category five storms, uh, very concerning, very dangerous storms. We got very lucky uh, that these did not hit South Florida, although several of them were forecasts uh, to do so. So um, we had to evacuate almost a million and a half people going back to Matthew in 2016 and the I got within 60 miles of us here in uh, those of you who live in Palm Beach County. Uh, Irma, we actually did experience quite a bit of wind from. It was a very, very uh, intense evacuation event, um, ultimately skipped south and landed in Kudjo Key, which was devastated. Um, but as of 24 hours out, Broward County was anticipating a direct hit from the storm. With six and a half million people uh, forced to evacuate, it led to a ton of issues that a lot of people didn't anticipate, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then Dorian, which really wrecked uh, the Abacos and uh, other aspects of the Bahamas, another Category 5 storm that got within 100 miles of us here in uh, Broward and Palm Beach County. So Irma was the one that actually had a big wind impact on us, and uh, we learned quite a bit from it. With all the evacuations, everything east of Federal Highway was a mandatory evacuation zone. So all of you in an HOA, and particularly condos and co-ops that were east of Federal Highway, were mandatory evacuations. 
A lot of people thought they could just go to the other side of the state and get a hotel room or stay with relatives. But because of the angle of that storm, the west side of the state was also evacuated areas like Naples and Fort Myers. Um, you couldn't get hotel rooms. Traffic was incredibly bad. Gas stations were running out of gas um, up and down 95 and the turnpike. Uh, owners were not really clear on what the association was supposed to do and what they were supposed to do. And early communication uh, was really critical. So this is a really important topic. I think everyone needs to, to recognize. Um, we have not had a really significant hurricane impact us here in South Florida since Wilma, which was going back to 2005. So that's 19 years here in South Florida that we have not experienced a, a major hurricane landfall. So many, if not all of your residents in some cases may have never been through a hurricane here in South Florida before. So you need to keep that in mind, especially those of you who maybe grew up down here, who've been down here a long time that are somewhat uh, knowledgeable and accustomed to how these things work. You have a probably majority of your owners now who've never been through a storm like this and uh, communication is gonna be more important than ever. So the first thing we gotta worry about is what to do before the storm. Uh, I can't stress this enough, having a hurricane plan is critical. If you don't have a plan, you need to develop a plan, practice that plan, and then improve upon the plan. So us as a management company, we have pre-designed templates for all of our associations to use, to customize to their property. Um, they're very comprehensive. Unfortunately, you know they are proprietary. I'm not going to be distributing those today. But what is a good plan? It, it ultimately encompasses all areas of preparing your physical property, um, for the impending storm. And then it also talks about what to say to the residents both before and after the storm. Um, you really need to make sure that you're thorough, that you think of all the little details. Um, that you, and then once you think you have a plan, again, super important aspect of all of this, practice the hurricane plan. Um, so many people draw up a plan or they think they know what to do, but then they don't realize how long does all this take? Um, you know, how much labor, how much staff do you need to actually complete the plan? How long do you have all the equipment you need? We, uh, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with a property that went to go put up their shutters and realized that someone had stolen all of the wing nut fasteners. Why? Probably because they needed them for their house. I don't know. But ultimately, they had no fasteners at the last minute. Um, other places, you may not have closed your shutters for a long time if you're not doing kind of routine preventive maintenance. And do your shutters actually slide? Do they close? Do they lock? All these things that you take for granted, all of a sudden you have to do in 24 or 48 hours. And what could be a relatively easy process to get prepared, you might find is difficult or impossible without the right equipment, time, or, or labor. So be testing your emergency equipment, your generators that have sat for a period of time, emergency lights, batteries, all that stuff. They do go bad. They do wear out, uh, particularly if you don't use them. So make sure you pull all that stuff out. Make sure it works. If you do need additional labor to secure your property, where is that going to come from? Um, do you have a, a relationship with a vendor who may have access to some additional labor, perhaps your management company, landscaping company, other vendors? So you really need to think through if you need extra help, who's going to have it and what's it going to cost? Because there's a lot of people that need additional labor when we get into a hurricane situation. Um, if you have vulnerable residents that may need assistance, We'll talk about this some more in depth, but there are county resources available for that. It's not the association's responsibility to be trying to evacuate uh, individuals. In fact, it could be a liability and, and it could be a concern. So um, all that being said, what should you guys be doing right now? Create a plan if you don't have one. If you do have one, practice the plan, do a dry run and make sure that you have everything ready to go. Uh, trimming the trees is critical. Removing the coconuts, getting rid of any extra debris around the property. There's no reason you can't do that in advance. Uh, tree trimmers are very busy this time of year. Um, I would recommend getting yourself on a schedule so that the tree trimmer knows they can come out every year at, around this time. So you're not one of the last ones looking to get your trees trimmed or worse, trying to get trees trimmed right before a storm comes in. Um, this was a major issue in Irma, the landscaping debris. So particularly large HOAs, um, they had, you know, massive amounts of landscaping debris from the common areas plus the unit owners uh, residences that all came down into the streets into the and into the common area and it had to be stored somewhere um, there was not an immediate ability to pick up uh, you know ton, tons and tons of this type of debris so think about your property do you have some place where you can leave debris in piles for four weeks six weeks eight weeks 
um, while you're trying to coordinate pickup or trying to organize something through FEMA, because you, you want to know that in advance of the storm, not trying to figure out last minute where you're going to put everything. Have you talked to your landscaper about what it's going to cost to clean up uh, post storm? A lot of landscapers will agree to pricing in advance. Um, it will certainly be more expensive than what you pay on a regular basis, uh, but at least you know you're going with a trusted and insured vendor and uh, you're not going to get gouged. So I highly recommend talking to them in advance. If you're a condo, do you have a restoration company on call in the event of water damage, in the event of uh, that tarping may be necessary? Again, having these agreements in place, they look expensive, but they're not nearly as expensive as what you get dragged into uh, when you don't have a vendor on call and, and now everyone's dealing with the storm, uh, storm damage. So backing up sensitive information. You want to make sure you, you back it up to the cloud, a Dropbox, um, a, a, a Google account, something similar, your photos of the property, all the before photos, the insurance policies, important association documents, official records. Do not rely just on um, an external hard drive or something like that that could get lost, that could get damaged. Um, make sure you back it up to a reputable cloud source so that no matter what happens to your building, your condo, your home, uh, you have that stuff available to you. Um, front, those of you who have gated security, a lot of older HOAs and condos have very antiquated systems that actually manage the gate access. A lot of times that information is stored locally. Work with your vendor and think through what are we going to do with this old server that sits in the, in, the, uh, in the gatehouse in the event that we have no power or that, it, you know, if, what happens if it gets wet or damaged, you need to back up all that data as well. Drainage systems are critically important. Um, if you're responsible for weirs, um, if you have underground pipes, if you have uh, that connect lakes and or, or uh, give you access to South Florida water management spillways, you need to make sure all those things are clear of debris and are they functioning properly? Is your weir functioning properly? When was the last time anyone turned it? Is it rusted shut? Um, you may have responsibilities with South Florida water management to open those weirs during uh, storms and you need to make sure that you have the ability to do so. Have you talked to your security company? Do you have a policy in place for how those man gates will be uh, will be staffed? And then when will they when will the staff leave? At some point, they obviously have to go back to their homes. Um, are you going to be removing the gate arms? And, and how's that going to be done? And then how's the community going to be secured at, in the in the aftermath of a storm? These are all things you need to be thinking about. HOA boards, be aware of which homes are being worked on. Uh, construction materials are often sitting in driveways, sitting on roofs. Uh, think through, you know, you need to make sure that those things are not going to be flying around in a storm. Um, so try to get out ahead of that. And condos, there are more condos under construction than ever right now here in South Florida due to milestone inspections, due to um, all the other issues that are occurring. So you need to make sure that if you have swing stages, if you have construction uh, materials or debris and, and um, dumpsters and things, what is your plan with your vendor to secure all those in the event that we go under a watch or a warning? Waiting to the last second, again, it's going to be too late. So those are all things you guys need to be thinking about as, as board members to get the property prepared. But there's also some things you want to do to make sure that you're, insured, that you're meeting your insurance requirements. So, Paul, Chad, what can they expect on the insurance side in terms of preparation? Yeah, so the last place you want to be is if you have a damage uh, to your building throughout a storm, but you didn't document it beforehand. So one really important thing is to make sure you get some before pictures and videos of your building um, to just see what it's look what it looks like before the storm, so that in the event you do have a claim, you kind of have that comparison and you can see really clearly what exactly happened. Um, so you you can ask your agent. Maybe they might have any tips or services that they can. Uh, provide. Uh, I know we do one added service where we have a drone that flies over uh, a property and it kind of records satellite images of, of the whole building from different angles. So you get that before uh, before picture. Um, so that's a, a really good thing to do. Um, and then also, you know, you kind of touched on this before, just protecting the building as best you can. You want to take those measures, uh, put up shutters, put up boards, if you don't have impact resistant windows, just doing anything you can to protect the building and avoid damage is always good. Um, and you don't want to be in a situation also where you don't know who to call if something does happen. So know ahead of time, you know, who to call, 
have the carrier phone number in case your agent is also affected um, and you can't reach them. And a lot of times that can be on a policy. So, you know, have those policies ahead of time and just really know where to call and, and what to do uh, because you don't want to be in a situation where you're frozen and you, you don't really know who to call and, and that type of thing. Yeah, I think Evan, um, you you hit on a really important um, thing, and that is to just be uh, rehearse your your plan. Um, you know, trying to put those shutters up when you haven't done it, and the example of the wing nuts being gone is is something that happens more more often than you would think. And and you know, like Chad says, know where those policies are, know how to report a claim, because the sooner you do that the sooner you're going to, I mean, think about how many thousands of claims are going to be filed and you, you want to get that reported as quickly as you can. So uh, I talked about this a little bit on the other slide, but again, there's a bunch of agreements that you can have in place prior to the storm occurring, prior to a threat of a storm is really the best time to get these agreements in place. Um, that's again, help with your shutters, water restoration, tarping, road clearing, landscape debris, and security. So really think about having those in place now um, they don't cost anything typically to to have uh, it's just really a commitment to use a particular vendor and guarantee pricing so it's kind of a kind of a no-brainer so a lot of people uh, had asked um, what happens if you have residents with special needs is the association responsible how can we help those people i talked about this a little bit but they're um, there's a lot of resources through the particular county that you live in i listed the three uh, biggest here, but if you if you Google whichever county you live in here in the state of Florida, they all have pretty thorough hurricane resources, and most, if not all of them, do have a section of their uh, hurricane website related to special needs residents. They do offer those are people who ha may have oxygen, who may have uh, difficulty moving around. They have walkers, uh, wheelchairs, etc. They do actually have resources for that that have nurses at these shelters. Um, and I put some of the phone numbers here. So the, the best thing you can do is get this information out to your residents and get it out to them now. Um, there are registration forms that people should be filling out if they fall into these criteria um, to make sure they're qualified for these special shelters. There's even transportation available to these people, but they're not going to have much luck doing it at the very last minute. They want you to register now in advance of hurricane season so they can make sure they have uh, the proper list, the proper uh, information on these individuals and space for them um, at these shelters. So, so if educating the residents is key. So another question we got a lot of is, uh, what is the association's responsibility regarding evacuation planning? Um, the IRMA had really extensive evacuation orders and uh, some people did choose to stay. Um, but what, you know, what ultimately was the association responsible for? The association cannot force people to leave. You cannot physically evict people. The police may come and do that, depending on where your building is and how serious of a storm is coming. Um, but the association cannot and should not be physically removing people. Um, you cannot take people out of the building uh, by force. If they want to stay, they're going to have the right to stay. Um, but I would strongly encourage you to inform your residents now about what their responsibilities are uh, in the event of a storm and, um, and and make sure that if they do have special needs that you can try to help get them get them registered. People should have their evacuation plan in place um, and they should have a couple of options. A lot of people who thought going to the West Coast because they had family there was the easy option realized that it was not an option uh, with Irma. So so be cognizant of that. Um, another thing a lot of buildings uh, you know, will do when you get a lot of people who say they're going to stay, remind them that they will be living in a building potentially on the 5th, 10th, 14th, 20th floor. And you, know, you can imagine how hot it must get up there. Can they live without AC, power, running water for one, two or three weeks? Do they have enough medical supplies? Do they have enough medication? Um, can, you know, it will be August, September, possibly, uh, or maybe early October when these tip storms typically hit. Um, think about what the temperatures are going to be that time of year. We're talking about low to mid 90s, 100 percent humidity almost. Um, you know, remind people what it will be like if they stay, that there will be no resources. There will be no stores open. There will be no ability to get gas. Um, there will be no security. Uh, many of these build, you know, most of your buildings will not have 
security available because security will not be able to access the property. Um, security may be dealing with uh, issues with their own residences that, that may be uninhabitable. Um, there's no guarantee that that type of labor is going to be available. So, uh, and also the building will not have any staff. I mean, the, the janitorial staff, the maintenance staff, uh, the management staff that they're used to will probably be dealing with the same issues uh, that, you know, the security staff and your residents are. So, be aware, they are 100% on their own in very difficult conditions. And I think that'll often uh, help people understand that maybe it's not worth staying. But Paul or Chad, any any thoughts on that? I think I think the, the, the greatest takeaway, like you mentioned earlier, being that, you know, how many new people have moved here and haven't experienced anything like this is 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 really kind of eye opening. Um, and and. I, I think this is great information to give people a, a perspective of of what what it's really like after a storm. Right. So, oops. So what? Just uh, you know, we talked about you know what it can be like. So Wilma was the last storm. It was only only a Category Two storm by the uh, rating scale. Um, we felt Category Two two winds all throughout Broward, Palm Beach, and Dade counties. It left 3.2 million people without power, and that was 20 years ago. So I'm sure many more people are living down here now, and that number would be much, much higher. That's pro that was probably 60 or 70 percent of the residents of the Tri County area at that time. Uh, power was got out for up to two weeks, um, and we had 55,000 homes and 3,600 workplaces damaged just in Palm Beach County. Um, this picture is actually from a building that is that is in uh, Miami. Um, so you can see the damage that just a Category 2 storm did to a building, uh, an office building that did not have impact glass. So that's the last time we had a storm that was only a Category 2. So we got to remember that. So uh, getting into the post-storm issues, what does the insurance company expect from you after a storm like Wilma hits? So yeah, like we said before, just if you can protect your property and mainly yourself as best you can. That's the first thing you, you should do. Uh, protect yourself and your property, make any repairs you need to, to make uh, if it's possible. Um, and then after that, really the most important thing is to just immediately start documenting, you know, all of the damages that might have occurred. Because like we said before, you know, you, you don't want to be in a situation where, you know, if you've had damage and you don't document it, then you don't have the clear uh, evidence to present to an insurance carrier. So you're gonna wanna take as many photos and videos uh, as you can and get a real clear description of what damages occurred um, and take you know multiple angles. Uh, you wanna make sure everything is visible, whether it's cracks or whatever damages occur. Um, and then there's one interesting thing. So kind of a specific example of if roads are blocked and there's things in the way We've seen scenarios in the past where uh, people have used machines to try to clear the road, whether it's a chainsaw or whatever it is. Um, and sometimes this can potentially lead to more injury and just make a bad situation worse. So, uh, you know, be wary of, of unit owners and homeowners doing that and just make sure that you're being safe uh, and doing things uh, the right way. And, you, you know, you don't want to cause more injury. Um, and then also have an inspection when everything's calmed down, uh, you want to inspect the building, make sure everything's safe uh, and there's no structural issues. Um, and specifically the electrical areas, uh, if there's water damage there, then you're going to want to have an electrician come and inspect those to see if that's safe. Uh, so really just like double checking everything and ensuring that you're you know, safe to move forward. Uh, but documenting is also a, a huge, huge thing. Yeah, I think it's important for everybody to understand too that that that, that one of the bulletproofs on this slide is 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 uh, all policyholders have an obligation to the insurance company to protect the property from further damage. So you know sometimes um, uh, associations are afraid to spend money because they don't know if the if they're going to be reimbursed by the insurance company, and you know they'll call, but. In the case of an emergency situation, you have an obligation to protect that property. So if that if that roof is open, um, you know, tarp it, temporary repairs, prevent it, uh, water restoration, uh, those urgent repairs, those those have to be done. 
and and it's important that we we don't wait uh, or try and get approval from an insurance company to spend the money because we have an obligation to do that. So um, some people ask in the registration, what do you have to, what information do you actually need to provide when you go to file your claim? Yeah, I mean, you know, basic information, who, what, when, and and where. Uh, obviously, if it's a storm, we, we're going to know that when when it happened. So just some very big basic information to get it started, to get it filed. And, and you know, how you file that claim can can be, um, you know, through your agent. But when the storm hits, if if your agent is dealing with the same issues that, that the association is and there's no power, um, the insurance companies have redundancies in their system to to file claims, whether it be, you know, calling it in or going to their website and doing that. So you you want to have those numbers ahead of, ahead of time, as we talked about, you know, um, before the storm. All right. So that kind of gets into how you file a claim. Your, your point's really well taken that if your agent is overwhelmed or inaccessible, you can file it straight through your insurance carrier. But a lot of people probably don't necessarily know who their carrier is because they only deal with their agent. So they may want to look into that. Yeah. Um, and, and your other point about you don't need a comprehensive report to get a claim started. You're better off just getting a claim opened with the basic information. You can always add to it later. Exactly. So a lot of people ask about public adjusters when we do these things. Should I get one? Is it necessary? What are your thoughts on public adjusters uh, relative to hurricane damage? Yeah, this is a, a, a great issue to discuss here. So um, there is no there is no right or wrong answer, or, you know, hard, fast answer on this. So um, I think it's important for everybody to know when you're dealing with a complicated claim and, you know, there's there's extensive damage. You know, it's 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 a, it's a wise idea to have somebody on your side. I mean, the insurance companies have uh, adjusters that have extensive experience in this area. And when there, when there's roof damage and you're going to need experts like, you know, engineers and people to help um, kind of justify or ex or expose what the uh, what the damage is. And whenever there whenever there's a. Uh, um, a conflict or some sort of maybe disagreement on the scope of the damage or the amount of it, it's it's always good to have someone on your side that really is an expert in doing this. Um, on the other side of that, sometimes, uh, you know, insurance companies want to settle claims fast and fairly, and hiring a public adjuster is going to get you money you would have gotten anyway, and now you have to pay for a public adjuster service because they're going to take a piece of the claim. So that's kind of the balance of, of what you do. But, you know, generally speaking, when you have a, 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 a very large, complicated claim, having somebody on your side uh, is, is a big difference, especially a nonprofit board or, you know, a voluntary board that is going to be is going to be charged with overseeing this and making sure that that the uh, the members are are getting what they're entitled to. Right. And then, so the last thing you guys had mentioned, which I thought was really great, was when you do file a claim, it may start with the basics, but it's going to quickly evolve into a massive, uh, you know, back and forth with a ton of different reporting and pictures. So talk to us about this hurricane, hurricane claim journal concept. Yeah. So if, if you've done all the right things and you've taken the steps to document everything and get clear descriptions of what's happened and all that, you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you lose track of it or just lose the information. Um, so we found that it's really helpful if you create a hurricane claim journal where you just pretty much lay out everything uh, that's that's happening when it happens. So logging all the communication between you and your agent and the carrier, um, putting all of those photos, videos, uh, descriptions, the damages, all that into this journal, uh, and then if you had to make any immediate repairs or or uh, fixes to the building, then uh, keeping those receipts uh, for those expenses, just putting all of this in one place where you can kind of document from start to finish what happened uh, can be really helpful. Just in the in terms of staying organized, because you don't want to get disorganized, uh, and ultimately this just makes it a smoother claims process and 
can lead to a quicker and more accurate payout of your covered losses. So it's just going to make the situation smoother. Yeah. And, you know, by the way, the, the insurance adjuster, particularly the field adjuster, um, his or her job is to put all this information together and present it to a, a desk adjuster who's actually going to evaluate it and, and, and write a check. So when you put all this information and make their, their job easier, they're going to be very grateful. And this process is going to be a lot smoother than, you know, trying to dig up all this information. So, so having all of this readily available to them will, will be to your benefit. Um, one thing I forgot to mention earlier, uh, kind of getting into the Q&A, but before we do, um, was when you communicate with your residents now, one of the biggest issues we found with Irma, and I think it's a direct result of so many new residents that have moved to Florida, and it's there's been, that was pre-COVID, so I'm sure there's you know, hundreds of thousands more now, is that people didn't understand the difference between what they would be responsible for in the event of a hurricane and what the association would be responsible for in the event of a hurricane. Um, I'm sure most of you uh, have seasonal residents. If you're in condos, you have people leaving. Tell them now before they go, or at least now early before the season, hurricane season really gets underway, what are they responsible for? Like bringing in all the patio furniture, closing of their shutters, have they cleared out their fridges? Um, you know, a lot of people don't think about this stuff. And when the power's out for two weeks, you do not want a bunch of food in the fridge. So you've got to let people know what are they going to be responsible for. Another huge issue we had after Irma was we were inundated with hundreds, probably thousands of calls of people asking us what the status of their particular home or unit was. Um, there's absolutely not enough resources to go around after a storm to be telling each individual homeowner what their home looks like. It is, of course, everyone's number one concern, but they really need to make arrangements with either a, you know, a home, home watch service, a neighbor, a handyman, somebody locally that can check on their unit for them because management and staff are not going to be able to respond to all those people. If the damage is that bad, they're going to be inundated with work to do just to prepare the uh, repair the common areas and, and get the roads clear. So make sure people know you will not be checking on their homes and their units. And again, like I said, construction material and debris, a lot of people leave town with work still going on. They need to know that they're responsible for their vendors and that all that construction material or debris that may be in their driveway or in their yard, and that's got to be addressed. So I forgot to mention that earlier. So now we're getting into the Q&A. We have plenty of time here. Um, so someone asked, is there info specific to Brevard? Um, candidly, we didn't, we don't do a lot of business in Brevard a little bit, but again, any county that you live in in Florida, if you Google Brevard County Hurricane Plan, Brevard County Hurricane Assistance, you will immediately get all uh, the online resources that they have. It's very easy to find for your county. Um, so I just encourage you to do that. Um, Someone said, will the insurance carrier have nominated or preferred, I would I would say, contractors to repairing roofs, concrete, roads? Do they make those known to the condominium? So I guess, will, will your insurance company make recommendations on who should repair these items that have been damaged, or are you uh, kind of on your own? Uh, some have preferred providers on the restoration side. Uh, not very many at all have uh, roofing contractors, but... So, so you are going to be on your own to find that. And your point in the beginning of this uh, seminar to, you know, kind of tee those, those vendors up is, is key because after the fact, they're going to be inundated. Mm -hmm. So Stacy mentioned, if you are on oxygen or an oxygen concentrator, um, medical supply companies can give you a hurricane tank that will last longer. So that's good to know. Again, that is going to be a homeowner responsibility. I would not advise the association to take on that responsibility. Uh, Tammy mentioned Wilma was a Category 3 hurricane. Uh, yes, it, it was technically at landfall, but the, the measured winds here across the Tri-County area were measured primarily at Category 2 strength. That's why I, I mentioned it that way. Um, is it up to us to get the adjuster after a storm or the insurance company? So there might be some confusion here on... The insurance company is going to send their own adjuster at some point. Um, correct, Paul? Correct. Right. So when we talk about public adjuster, that would be an adjuster who who you would hire, the association would hire, to have their own experts. 
or you could deal with the insurance company's adjuster on your own because the public adjuster is going to take uh, a piece of the claim as, as a fee for his or her service. Mm -hmm. So Nancy mentions our insurance company, so we don't need to have a restoration company agreement. What's the advantage to having one? I have conflicting information. So uh, there's no necessity. The, the benefit of any of these arrangements you get into pre-storm is that you have confirmed contracted pricing in advance, so you're less likely to get gouged. Um, and hopefully the vendor has you, you know, there's no guarantees, but hopefully the vendor, you know, has you on a preferred list and you're going to get access to service quicker than all the other places scrambling after a storm to try to get service. But Paul, what are your thoughts on pre-storm agreements? Yeah, exactly that. I mean, you know, you're, you're hopefully going to get priority and you're, you're no, you know who you're dealing with. Uh, after these storms, there are going to be vendors that, that come out of the woodworks and you, and you don't know if, if they're going to perform or they're not going to perform. It's so much better dealing with a known commodity, somebody that's been around for, for a long time. Uh, that, that has tremendous value after the storm. So Susan mentions they have assured partners for a large community with numerous insurance companies for different parts of the total insurance package. Would assured partners not be of help in filing an inclusive claim? So maybe we want to clarify that a little bit. Yes. Well, so so the agent's role, assured partners' is role is we're we're not the actual insurance company, so we're not going to settle the claim. We're our role is to help you find the best insurance company, write the policies, help you make a decision, and we have claims advocate on our on our staff that will help. Uh, submit a claim, get it started, and basically, when when a storm like this hits, it's all hands on deck on at our firm, where everybody's assisting and trying to uh, supply information to the insurance company. But I think it's important for everybody to understand that your agent isn't going to be the source who writes the check. That's that's the obligation of the insurance company. So Michael asks, can an association or board restrict portable generator use? So um, I would say, I don't know why a board would want to do that in the aftermath of a storm. I think everyone's just trying to get by and any help, any power that people can have will be appreciated. I would also question what the practicality of that would be. I don't know that you'll be able to send violation letters in the aftermath of a storm. I don't know how you would enforce that by the time you were able to deal with it. It would probably be too late. Um, as far as the legalities go, you could certainly ask your association attorney, but I don't think it's very practical. I would just be very careful that people aren't using them in an unsafe way, like using them indoors. It's the biggest thing. So, right. Paul, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I concur. Is safety's key there? You know, um, uh, maybe you could, I, I agree with you, it's going to be hard to, to enforce that, but, you know, common sense, practicality, you're dealing with, with gasoline, fuel, and, and things like that. Using it indoors obviously presents a huge hazard, but also where they're, where they're storing the gasoline and, and all of that, it, encourage as much safety as you can. Right. So, uh, Anthony mentions, the, have you found that most associations have a reserve for hurricane repairs and how much? So. There's actually kind of a technical issue with that. Reserves are defined as an item uh, with a useful life of greater than one year and a replacement cost of more than $10,000. So a hurricane reserve is really not a reserve by definition, and you need to talk to your lawyers and accountants about that if you wanted to establish one. Um, I would say most buildings don't have one. Um, some have kind of a catch-all reserve, perhaps, uh, but it's uh, it's really really a building by building issue. Um, there's also some other thoughts about well, why should the owners who don't live there pay for a hurricane? You know, if I we haven't had a you know hurricane here now, and that was a direct hit in 19 years. It's a lot of owners who paid into a hurricane fund and they never experienced a hurricane. So is that appropriate for those owners either? So I would talk to your accountants and legal counsel if that's something you want to do. Probably a good idea, Evan, too, to remind everybody that um, most, if not every single association has some sort of large retention when it comes to hurricane deductibles on their property policy. So depending on how the building is valued, it'll be a percentage of that building, typically 5% we're seeing now. 
but you know could be as low as three percent. So that's going to generate you know a big a big deductible that the association is going to have to be responsible for uh, before the insurance company pays anything. Right. So Grace asks about garbage disposal. Um, so there's there's trash pickup and then there's you know what I would call bulk storm pickup, which is you know could be tons and tons of debris. And I would say it it really depends on your local waste management authority. So make sure you reach out to them in advance. Um, yeah, again, that's one of those pre-storm things you can do is find out what is the local waste management authority's position on hurricanes, hurricane cleanup, and involving uh, FEMA. Um, let's see here, Tracy. What would be your recommendation when the board oversteps their role invoking emergency powers? <laughs> I would say if you're concerned about the board overstepping their authority, that's that's a legal issue. Um, so I would I would get an attorney involved if you think your board has overstepped. But I, I would say in my experience, um, boards really are trying to do the best they can to restore the property. I uh, certainly can't speak for all boards, but no one likes to go through a hurricane type situation. The expenses are enormous. There are often assessments because of it, even just with landscape debris cleanup, we had dozens of assessments uh, related to Irma. So and that and really caused no property damage or no or very little, depending on where you were. So um, a significant storm is going to be costly. There probably will be assessments um, and your board hopefully is doing the best they can. Yeah, you know, and all the there's so many costs that are associated with 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 a hurricane that are not covered by the insurance. Debris removal is a great example of that. Um, you know, debris removal with no damage to the building, with it's just all landscape and damage to all that landscape is typically not covered by insurance. You can buy a parametric policy that we call, um, but because rates have been so high in the recent few years, those those policies have kind of fallen away. But it's, it's sort of like an AFLAC benefit where if, if the hurricane hits in a certain area um, and the wind speeds are you know greater than X, then you get a flat benefit to pay for those uncovered items such as debris removal and landscape damage and all those things that you got to pay for. But uh, again, you know, it's, it, rates have been so high, those policies have kind of um, haven't been very popular. Right. All right. Well, I think we got through all the questions. Um, we got through all the slides. So at this point, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I hope uh, there was a few nuggets of useful information for you. Um, I can't stress enough. Most, if not all of your residents have probably not experienced this yet um, or before, and you need to be overly communicative and um, go well above and beyond uh, what you might have had to do 10 or 15 years ago, because people just don't know and um and they need to be educated so i'll leave you with that paul chad anything else yeah evan i think uh, great presentation and um exactly what you say in, in being prepared know what those insurance policies cover what they don't cover be familiar with those and be prepared to respond uh to get it get a claim filed and make those emergency repairs as fast as you can um and communicating to your to your residents like you say is is a key Awesome. All right, Paul, Chad, thank you. Appreciate you guys being on. All of you who joined us today, thank you for being on. Future classes will be on CampbellEvents.org. That's CampbellEvents.org. And uh, look for us on future seminars. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for watching. For more great educational content, click the subscribe button now.